I am a woman. I am a woman. I am a woman. I am a woman. I want to be successful. I want financial support. I want affordable health service. I want to be powerful. Powerful. Supported. Inspired. Connected. Educated. 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 I want specialized banking. I want maternal care. I want to be empowered. I am a woman. I am a king woman. I am a king woman. I am a king woman. I am a W woman. When I interviewed T.Y. for the King's Women series, it was round about our 10th anniversary of me interviewing her for the very first time. So it was a big moment for us both. Now, anyone that knows T.Y. knows two things. The first one, she's very private and she protects it. So it was such an honor for her to let me into her personal space. Now, the most important of it all, the second one, is that she's very, very spiritual. So it was very powerful for me to understand the root of it all. I was raised by a single mom. Um, my dad died when I was 10 and I didn't really get to know my dad much before then. I spent the first six years of my life raised by my grandmother. My grandmother was everything. When my grandmother died, I moved to Lagos and I was raised by my mother. My mother literally raised four children by herself. So I was, I, I, I grew up knowing that when you were a woman, you worked. I grew up knowing that you had to be independent. I grew up knowing that you had to learn to make your own money. Because my mo that was who my mother was. My mother was very, very hardworking. She was very independent. I didn't get to know much about my dad until I became an artist myself. And every time I went somewhere and there was anybody who was in the creative industry and they were over 60, and I would tell them my maiden name, they'd be like, Shomore Minye. And I found out my dad was a very famous, very well-known producer, you know. It's unfortunate that I didn't know my dad, but now, when I see people who knew my dad, they'll tell me, look, at that's your dad, that's his smile. That's how he would have done this, you know. So um, I, have, I have wonderful people as parents. I have a nickname for my dad. I call him the Veranda Man. Um, I remember when my, my mom raised me and I didn't know my dad. My, I, my, I lived with my mom and not with my dad. And I remember I started writing music because I used to have these fantasies about my parents, you know, coming together in this like love story. And I, I would write about that. And that's how I started writing songs. And I remember the last time I saw my dad, you know, I was, I was being driven by my mom and I was sitting behind the car and he was on the veranda. And in my mind, I was like, don't worry, very soon, you won't be on the veranda. You're going to be, you know, going to be in my life. So not long after that, my dad passed away. My dad had a stroke when he died. I remember crying, not because I was going to miss him, because remember, I didn't really know my father. But his dying had taken away a fantasy that I had. I mourned my dad, but it wasn't for very long because he, he wasn't in my life. My life was my mother. My mother was my life. But then, as I started to grow up, I started to meet my dad through Steve Rhodes, through um, Sonny Okosu, who told me my dad bought him his very first guitar, who told me that, you know, when you came to Lagos, you would go to a place called NTA and look for a man called Remy Shokefo because he might be your very first big break. He might put you on television. His legacy was something that I got to know way much later in, in my life. He, I didn't know. My mom, of course, would tell us tons and tons of stories. But I spent the better part of 20, 20, 2005, you know, interviewing older artists. And every artist that I, photo, I photographed that was 50 or 60 or, or just grew up in the 60s and 70s, every single one of them knew my dad. Every single one of them. 
my mom worked hard. As in, she just always never wanted you to know that there was. A, she never wanted. She made you content. She taught you to be content. You know, you were taught not to be greedy. But my mom just never wanted you to lack anything. If everybody in your class went to London summer holidays, my mother would work just to be able to say yes. I also went to London for summer holidays, but I never ever felt that there was anything missing. My mom was enough. She was enough. So I went to a friend's house. Their dad came back from maybe the, from Paris and had bought them this very exotic chocolate. Growing up, I'd never seen Toblerone. And then my friend goes, do you know what this is? This is Toblerone. Have you ever seen Toblerone before? He said, my dad bought me Toblerone. So you don't have a dad. Who will buy you Toblerone? You see, this sounds like nothing, but for a little girl, it meant everything. I don't have a dad. That's why nobody bought me Toblerone. You know? And for the very first time in my life, I felt like, oh my God, there's something that they have that I don't have. You know? And that is why, that is why, that is why I'm so glad that no one sold me the wrong father figure because I would have quickly embraced it. God was the first father figure that was sold to me. You know, as a young girl, you know, accept God into your heart. He'll be your father. He'll take care of you. Do you understand? Do you understand? I can ask God for Toblerone. <laughs> I can always ask God for Toblerone. But prior to that, I had never felt, I'd never felt empty. I'd never felt anything was missing. I had this young girl, her name was Ibron Rhodes. And I remember we used to stay in the hostel. And Ibron became my closest friend in school. What I didn't know was that Ibron was dying. And then one day she called me and said, Tiwai, Tony, I have a secret for you. I said, I'm dying, but I'm not afraid because I know I'm going to go to heaven. My friend had leukemia. And we're all 11 years old. This was 1989. I says, do you know why I'm not afraid? I said, because I'm a Christian. And when I die, I know I'm going to go to heaven. And this was where my Christianity came out from. I don't think Ibrahim can live another three or four months after we had that conversation. Ibrahim Ken did die. And Ibrahim Ken did lead me to God and tell me about God. So I remember we used to go fetch water. We used to fetch water in the hostel. And while we're waiting, you know, we used to wake up early to have our bath before there was a long line. And she would tell me about God and she would tell me about heaven. So after Ibrunke died, I became very close friends with her elder sister who told me more and more and more about God. And so, of course, I became the God person in secondary school. I became the one who led um, fellowship in school. I became the one that, um, you know, would sit, stand in the middle of class and talk about God. So that was what secondary school was for me. I became a leader very quickly because don't forget that we were the very first set. And then I was this good example. It was so much pressure on me. Because if I ever did anything wrong, you'd be like, and look at yourself, and you call yourself a Christian. So very quickly, I had to be goody to choose. I remember going to my secondary school reunion after 26 years, um, or 26 or 24 years, um, last Christmas. And everybody had exactly the same thing to say, that I would always grab their hand and say, Larry Alabi, it's time. I think it's time for you to give your life to Jesus. That was who I was in secondary school. I felt like that was who I had to be. But I think it, in many ways, it also helped me grow up really quickly because I became the confidant. I became the person that people would talk to when they, when they were dealing with the fact that they had been sexually abused. I was that person that they could talk to. When they were having their parents having issues, I was that person that they felt that they could talk to. So I think that really helped me grow up really quickly. So I would say that it wasn't as fun as it would have been because I grew up really quickly in secondary school. I was, I was mommy very, very quickly. Ah, Kim. I have to ask my husband if I can share this story. 
And if he says yes, then you can share it. Okay. You promise me. I was sexually abused as a child. And because of this, I felt like there was something ugly about me that had me encounter this. This wasn't the abuser's fault. This was me. Why aren't other girls, why aren't, why are they all? I used to see other girls as flowers and I saw myself as dirty cement, hard and ugly. So I never felt beautiful. I never did, I never did. I thought there was, everything was wrong with me. My brows were a problem. I was hairy and it was a problem. And I always attributed everything that was about me to, the, to be the reason why someone took advantage of me. There was something wrong with me. Do you understand? If the other girls were like me, perhaps they'll be dirty like me, but they're flowers, you know? They're pretty and they're beautiful. Nobody does that to a beautiful girl. So for a long time, salvation, salvation, when, when, when Ibi Ronke told me about salvation, and she told me all things will be passed away and all things will become new. It was as if God would wash that cement, that thing, that stench that caused that to happen to me as a child. Salvation could take that away. Then me too, I could be a girl. Because I didn't feel like a girl. When I grew up, I felt like an imposter. The girls were innocent. So I always had to be, behave like I was also innocent. Do you understand? So imagine my shock growing up to find out that one out of every three or four girls that were in my school had been through the same. And I could, t I could tell them the same thing. Hey, all things passed away. This thing, this Jesus thing. Do you understand? Come with me. It can take that away. You don't want to know how many people I had to tell that. So it was, it was a relief for me to find out that I wasn't the only one. But it's also a shock for me to find out that nobody talks about this. That nobody talks about this. This is my first time actually talking about this. This is my first time ever mentioning this to anyone beyond me. That's why salvation worked. I had a daddy and I was going to be a flower again. I was going to be a girl. Do you understand? And I was going to be beautiful. Because God was going to wash my sins away. Now imagine what that means for an 11-year-old. So, I wasn't really into boys because I was a fresh flower and I just wanted to stay a fresh flower and they should just leave me alone. And even afterwards, I still never felt beautiful, but at least I didn't feel dirty. I'm very, very shy. People don't believe I'm shy. People meet me and, in fact, Early this morning, I was walking out from my room and there was someone in my living room and said, T.Y., why are you bouncing? Because I hop when I walk. You understand? And that gives the impression that, hey, I have a lot going on. I must be fun. And I must go everywhere. And they don't realize that. And my hair gets bigger every year because this is what I hide under. Do you understand? I'm, I'm really very shy. And I'm really, really shy. And, you know, and... But when I give of myself, I give all. When I give of myself to every to anything, I give all of it. When I when I love, I love with with all. I don't know how to love halfway. I don't know how to give halfway. You know, if I give, I give all. But then I give all, and then I run back into my. And I've always been this way. It's just I have this face, and I'm very expressive. So people are deceived to think that, you know, my friends yawn at the mention of my name because they know that there's nothing really going on. If TY, if we plan to do something, TY is going to ruin it. That's, that's, that's exactly who I am. But, but I think I, I, I'm having a fantastic life. I think, I think every dream that I've ever had, I've, I'm living. I'm living my dreams, literally. Everything that I pray for. I may not get it when and how I, I want it, but every dream I've ever had has come to me. I love 
transformation. I love to watch someone go from nothing and become something. Do you understand? And, and that has always appealed to me because that's the story of my life. Remember, I said that I was brick and cement. And, and I've had this spiritual experience that has made me feel like I am blooming. You understand? And anything that makes that happen, anything that I can do that can make that happen, either creatively, either through music or through, through makeup or through hair or through, it's the same thing I do with my music that I do with my photography that I did with hairstyling and I still do, you know, once in a while or with makeup is, is helping people find beauty or find inspiration or hope in themselves to realize that they are beautiful you know and hairdressing did that for me i, I studied I remember i was the best um cosmetology student in my class the best beauty therapist in my class because it appealed to everything that i had experienced as a person that i can find someone who had acne i can make it go away do you understand that's redemption i love redemption i love that I can see something and it's nothing. And I can make you look like all that on a bag of chips. Do you understand? And for me, hairstyling is different from photography, but it's the same thing. It's, it's styling someone's hair and flipping them over and having them look in the mirror and they're almost falling out of the chair. That's what I've always wanted to do. You know, and that's the same thing I do with my photography. As in, I love makeovers. I love, you know, having someone who thinks they are nothing and feel like yes. When I got into University of Lagos, I used to live on a, a, a block called F Block. And so I started my hair salon called F202, F202 Style Studio. When I did hairdressing, I know I had aunties who would come and say, hairdresser, who want to be a hairdresser. And in their mind, a hairdresser is somebody who who is struggling or somebody who you, you know, less, who's less than, you know. But I would carry everything that I did and I would put it on this high pedestal and say, yes, I'm a hairdresser. I'll never forget this experience once. I, I did hair for someone for her wedding. i never forget that day. I did her and she had like 12 bridesmaids. I remember that um, this particular bride, because she had her weave done, usually they would use a glue and stick it so it would be flat, but she had a weave done. So when I did the te ten reel, it just didn't quite fall perfectly well. And I had done 16 people, and then when I left, she hadn't paid me. So I remember going there with my boyfriend at the time, in the evening, before, because she was going back, she was moving abroad. And I remember going to her house and asking for my money. I think my entire bill for all, for all 16 people was, I think it must have been, she had to pay me, was it 5,700 naira or something? As in, it was a lot of money for me at the time. And then she goes, um, don't you know we're busy? We're finished doing the hair. Can you, so I, so I said, okay, no problem, that I'll wait, you know? And then I remember that her husband that she just married looked at me and said, my wife said you did not do her tendering her web, and the tender did not fall flat, and that now you are here coming to collect money. How much is your money? And I told him how much it was. And you know what he did? I remember they lived in this fancy house in GRA. And he goes, here's your money, he counted it. It was 50, 100, 100 now, 50, 50 now. He counted it, and then he flung the money on the floor. And then my boyfriend and I, at the beginning, the money won by one. And it was when we got out of their gates that it occurred to me what he had done. That was the most, <laughs> that was the most, that, that was the most undignifying experience of my life. Because I said to myself, I'm not a prostitute. I did not come to collect prostitute money. You flung money at me and made us pay for it. And inside my heart, I said to myself, I said, I'm going to work hard at this hairdresser. And I didn't even know I was going to be a hairdresser for much longer. And I'm going to make sure that I'm the best. And that no one will ever be able to fling money at me on the floor in my life. 
I made, I, it was like, I, 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 I talked to my boyfriend, I said, I, am, I, I was crying. And I said, I'm going to be so good at this that no one would ever be able to do that to me again. And I think that thing stayed with me for a long time. I can't even remember her name. I remember more making music in University of Lagos than I remember going to class. In fact, I was so obsessed. In fact, I was so obsessed with hairstyling that the only reason why I read was so that I could pass, so that I could go and make hair. Because I knew that my mom wouldn't let me start a hair, 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 hairstyling business if I did not graduate. So that was my motivation. Every time I slept in class, I was like, let me just pass and finish with this degree so that I can just go and face my hair, hairdressing and my music. I remember when I met um, M.M. and Lara, because then I didn't write music, I just wrote rap. You know, I thought that was my thing, you know, I could, um, I could freestyle, I could, you know, by nature, but I, I, I knew when it was right. I knew when it rhymed, when the rhyme was tight. I knew when it was flat. I knew, I knew. Nobody taught me, I just knew. Of course, I had a few tut tutors with rap. I, I know I had a few mentors, but naturally, I've always had a thing for music. My mom tells me it's in the blood. My dad played the guitar. He would sit out and, and all his friends were musicians. You know, he, that was what he did. That was what he lived, you know. But when I say I'm writing a song, I'm not being creative. I'm not creating something. I'm eavesdropping into something that already exists and just becoming a channel to bring it to life. I remember the first time I wrote Greenland for two weeks. I told my son, I told my best friend, I'm reading this song about green, green, green something. I just can't remember the song. I, it's just something about green, you know? I wrote that song to encourage myself. I was very discouraged. I'd come back into Nigeria. I had been away in England for months. I'd been away from my business for months. And these Oibo people had come into Lagos and started this fancy studio in Lagos. I didn't even get to come back to Lagos. One of my friends who was a photographer said, see right, it's finished. They've come, they have a building. They even have a room where they show people their photos before they buy them. I said, how are we going to survive? And I'd come back into Lagos and two things had happened. My name was now T.Y. Bilu. Nobody knew who T.Y. Bilu was. So I was pretty much starting my business all over again. And I've never been one to be competitive. And whether or not I admitted it. I already had competition. Everything felt like a desert. And I remember I was having a shower and I was going, the land is clean, it's clean, oh, to, to, to encourage myself. And I forgot the song. Like three weeks after that, and I, I don't make that mistake anymore. When songs come to me, I must write it down and I record it somewhere. When it came back, it didn't come back as the chorus. It came with verse one, refrain. You know, the whole song was structured and laid out. I see my music as that place that I can do what I do with my photographs. I love when someone comes into my space and they're feeling down about themselves or they don't like their curves or they don't think they look very pretty. And you must remember that I know what it feels like to not feel pretty. So I make sure that if I ever touch you, if I ever photograph you, I don't care who you are, you will know you are beautiful and you will know why. You understand? You will know that you are fine. But not only know that you are beautiful, not just vain beauty, you will know why. I will find out why. And I will not tell you, I will show you. And that's what I do with my music. I want people to know who they are. Do you understand? I want you to know that you are special. You know, God says you are special. You are special. I never liked my voice. I thought it was a bit funny and it was, it was never smooth. It was always rough and it was always deep, you know. And even as a girl, you know, I wanted to be, hi, my name is T.Y. But I was like, hi, my name is T.Y. I just, just never liked my voice. I liked being in the choir and I liked to write music. But I never had to stand up and sing the songs myself. Because I never did feel like people wanted to listen to my kind of sound. And that's why I write, liked rap music, because at least I didn't have to sing. I could just, you know, vibe my way through it. And if I sang at all, it wasn't really singing, you know. It's taking me time. And even now, I, I would tell people, you know I'm not a singer. And I've learned to say, 
no, I'm a singer. I have a voice. And God likes my voice. And it's authentic. And it's, it's a genuine sound. It's not contrived. And it's mine. It's taken me 16, 20 years of singing for me to come here and accept that I'm a singer. Where I make music and where I'm really free is when I pray. Because I sing pray. And I can sing it anyhow and I'm not, I'm not shy. And I know that God is listening and God doesn't mind. When I'm in pain, I sing. When I'm afraid, I sing. When I have no words, I sing. When I'm happy, I sing. When I'm thankful, I sing. When I go into my quiet place, that is the one place where no song is bad. So I'm learning to realize that I have to flip the script. What God thinks about my voice is more important than what anybody else thinks. And if I can find that place of freedom, then that acceptance that I've been trying to get, I wouldn't even need to look for it. It would be there. I was a floater in Moremi Hall. I didn't have a room. You know, you can be a squatter. Squatter means you have somewhere, you know, maybe you put your mattress near that person's bed. A floater is, you ain't got no space, you ain't got nowhere to, nowhere to float. So I was a floater and I used to float once in a while into Lara's room. And I would sleep on the floor or maybe when she's gone to class, I'll sleep on her bed because I had no accommodation. So I would go into her room and I would write a song and we would sing together or she'd write a song and we just used to randomly sing together, not for anything. Same thing with M.M. I remember when I eventually got accommodation, I would write a, a rap verse and she'd come and she'd do a chorus. And then we'd get together and we'd create a song that ah, we had never heard around anywhere, you know? And then, once Lara, M.M. and I came together, magic.
as a band. It was very painful. You know, it's something that I've never really spoken about, but it was very, very painful. Everybody else had a theory about why Kush broke up. And that made it even more difficult because you couldn't explain to everyone, no, this was actually what happened, or that was what happened. You know, you had to sit there and watch the public dissect your life. And they weren't there. They don't know how it happened. They, don't, they weren't there on the day. They, don't, they weren't there in the period, in the season, you know. So I, for one, was like, after this, you can't kill me. I can never sing. I'm done. Completely done with music. I'm just going to take my camera and I'm going to make images. So the very first thing I did after Kush broke up was I... I took on a residency with the gallery in England and I was like, I'm going to immerse myself in this photography thing. And the very first job I got when I came back to Nigeria was from Sandy Obiago and she asked me to photograph her in her in concert. And I will never forget that day with my telephoto lens. We photographed every nuance as that man sang. And it was like, oh my goodness, I fell in love with music again, standing behind a camera. When you, when you um, come together with perfect strangers and you, you birth something that, that is real, Kush was real, we made real music, we spent time together, we played, we fought, we traveled around the world together, we, we you know, had things we were believing God for that came to pass. We worked hard, we, we put in everything. It was like a marriage, as in, we all had dreams for it. And even though it was for a long time, we weren't planning for it to end. It wasn't supposed to end, it was supposed to go forever. We were supposed to have kids and get married and continue to make music together. It was a very, very painful thing. But I also knew it was real. And I also knew that that was the only way. Because we were not in the same place. And we didn't want the same things. And when your vision, when you start to grow and your visions are different, it takes a lot of maturity to keep that both together. And maybe we just didn't have it. We've had tons of conversations about getting back together. We, we talk about it all the time, you know. I just think that at time, as time goes on, it's just become more and more difficult, you know. Because I, I always feel like, I personally feel like we're, we're just in very different places. We're not, you know, music is not the same for me. Music is so different for me. I'm not a, I don't see, my, I don't even see myself as a full-time musician, you know. I, I, I only, my, even the music that I make as myself is in, in this little suitcase that I open up once in a while, you know. So I think that's what it is. I mean, we're, we're very different people, you know, and, and they're good people. I mean, I went through four years of university and did so many creative things. And never once did I think I could be a photographer. I didn't even think it was an option. I didn't even think it was a thing. I thought I was going to be a hairstylist for the rest of my life. I was going to sing and I was going to make hair. And that was going to be it. Until one day I was doing hair for a bride and her younger sister used to work for Jackie Phillips, a much older photographer. And Jackie Phillips made this beautiful portrait of her. And it was like a passport. I looked at the portrait and I looked at her. I the portrait, I looked at her. I'm like, this picture is finer than you, I'm sorry. Who did this thing? And they said, oh, it's Jackie Phillips, and that the bride is going to stop over and take some photographs, and if I wanted to come along. But unfortunately, I couldn't come along because I had another bride on the day. But that photo stayed with me. So I called my friend, and I got the address, and I remember going into Jackie Phillips' studio and peeping through the glass. And then I saw photographs of Babangida, I homo, like all the big military men of the time, as in all the big people. And, and, um, and I remember right there, I heard it. I heard, we're going to do this. We're just going to do it differently. And as soon as I heard it, I kid you not, I saw a woman with hair over her face, doing like that. I saw one of my images. 
and then I just blurted out, I want to be a photographer. What? I don't know. I don't know what a camera really was or what aperture was. I remember the very first photography book that I ever read was MM's dad old photography book from the 70s. And I didn't even understand anything, but I knew I was a photographer. Even though I'd never met a photographer, a proper one, it was just a, a voice. I heard it. I, I think what makes me a, a good portrait photographer is that I really see people. In fact, it's so funny, I meet a lot of my subjects like on a regular day and I can't recognize them. Because the moment I know I'm photographing someone, I already see like them in their most beautiful state. You know, I already know that their hair should be pulled back because they've got these beautiful eyes and or this wonderful smile or it's the teeth or the jaw or the lack of it or whatever or or it's the brows or it's the cheekbones and the you know and sometimes even things that people are shy about and are self-conscious about I'm saying you're self-conscious about that that's what makes you beautiful I think it's a gift to be able to look at someone and find out what's beautiful about them maybe because I was a hairstylist or maybe because I did makeup but I not only see people as beautiful it's like I see this fantasy it's almost like you know today if you've ever thought you were beautiful we're going to make it happen today and there's this image of you in my head and I can see you that way and that is that is exactly who you are that is you you know and it's 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 almost it's it's really strange you know meeting people and photographing them because before I make the image I already know the image and I aspire to that you know and sometimes it's not even necessarily an image it's just an impression in my heart about who they are you know photography also is is wonderful for me because I don't really have many many people that I make very deep long-term connections with but with photography in that short period, I connect with people deep. It's like I almost know everything about who they are. Their, their fears, their, their, what they're proud of, their insecurities, their, their achievements and their accomplishments. And, you know, in, in one day with someone, I, I, I almost feel like I'm like a family member, like I'm a friend. Heatherington, and he had come in to do this photography workshop with um, with like a few Nigerian photographers. And I remember that um, then I was traveling with Kush, and I, I didn't have time to do the assignment, which was basically to tell a story. You needed to tell a story. You needed to have a point of view about anything. So I just thought, you know what? I'm traveling with my band. I'm just going to take photographs of my band, and I'm going to give it to Tim. And Tim was like, uh, I see the photos of your band, but it's like a nice journal of your trip, but there's no story here. I want you to experience something that touches you and I want you to tell the story. And I don't know how in the world I thought about this. I thought of going to an orphanage and I was going to wake up with them. I wanted to see what it was like to wake up as an orphan. And I, um, I went to this orphanage and I, I, I asked them if I could come in and make photographs. And I woke up with them. It was um, Little Saint Orphanage, the campus for the older kids you know and it was closer to my house at the time so I, I could be up there at 5 a.m and i made these images of these kids having breakfast worshiping i think it was the images of the kids in prayer that really had me like they didn't pray like the way you saw Bart simpson rubber dub dub thank for the grub as in they prayed like their lives depended on it and i made these images in this dingy dark room before they got ready for school. And I remember a friend of mine asking to buy one of the images. I was like, no, I don't want to buy one of the images. So to buy it. I was like, I don't want one. I want all. In fact, I don't want it for myself. Let me call people, all my friends, and they'll come in and then they'll buy all the images. And, um, and then all the... Home and... Um, and I remember telling Pula about Madame Ekudayo and 
and and again the song was gifted to me. It wasn't the song I wrote. I just was sitting down in my office one day and I went, eh, kudayo, shibo, emiko, isha oluwani. Because she kept going, Emiko, isha oluwani. Her words will sound over and again. Undoubtedly I have been changed. Now I don't have words like that. that God wanted to tell. And I wrote the song and, and I remember that when I visited and I knew I had to go back because it was a very long journey. Sometimes things happen that are bad and you think it was a curse. Those images I had of Madame Ekundayo, if I had those images developed, I would have never felt the need to travel all the way back because I'll feel like with these images I can tell her story. But there was so much more to be told. When I wrote the song and it was time to do the video, I was so pained that there were no images. Also that she always spoke about my children, but I always was like, okay, yeah, I'm sure God will do it, it will happen. She would tell me that my children are blessed and that they are homo dada, homo dada, no homo eh. I remember that when we went to see my mama, mama used to do crochet and she would knit. And somebody bought... and said that Mama had knitted this and said it was for my son. I didn't have kids at the time. They weren't coming. So I felt like, yes, this is God telling me that there is a son. ...to you. I said, no, 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 they've already given me. She said, no, there's another gift. She needed exactly the same oja. Now, if she had gone to buy one, I'll be like, oh, it was spontaneous. It takes time to knit an oja. You have to literally sit down and create it. So I remember the... When I first got married, I wasn't, I didn't think it wasn't a big deal that I didn't have kids, you know, the first couple of years, because I'd never doubted that I would have kids. I think the problem started when I felt like, okay, I think I'm ready now. And in my mind, I thought that um, I could just clap the children into being and just because I was ready now, they would come and they weren't coming. And even though I was terrified, I would never, even for many years, admit to myself that I was terrified. Because I felt like if I admitted that I was terrified, then that, means that, that, that meant that there was a problem. And if I admitted that there was a problem, that means that maybe then I wouldn't be a mother. So it's better to just bury your head in the sand and, and hope that it happens somehow. But then I think the hardest part was knowing that you were meant to be a mother and having to come face to face with the fact that you have infertility issues, that there's a word, infertile, you know, and, and you know, it's funny enough, eh? I've, 
never meditated on that word, childless. This whole process of doubting and faith and believing and doubting and believing and doubting has made me realize that when God blesses you, sometimes it's not just about you. If it was based on faith that I had my children or conceived and got pregnant, you know, it's not, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't medical science. Even the doctors had plenty doubt, you know, plenty, plenty of doubt. I don't think that was bad English or good English, but I'm sure you will protect me because I'm just... But I didn't have enough faith. I went from somebody who absolutely believed it, like I believed my name, but from failing over and over again, I secretly stopped believing and I felt like God was unfair to me because I felt like if he knew that I was going to be a not going to be a mother, then why did he allow me flower this last few years? I should have been a miserable woman. But now I look at my children and I look at every single process. The waiting, the believing, the doubting, the failing, the hopes, the fears. Everything that I went through and everything that my spouse and I went through, they are really worth it. As in, I feel like everything, do you understand, is part of their story. It's part of it's their story too. This wasn't just about me or, or it's their story too. The world teaches you that getting pregnant should be the easiest thing in the world. You should just get pregnant. You shouldn't. I remember a friend of mine, you know, when I didn't know what I was going through, she was just like, see, why can you just do this, get pregnant now? And she, she snapped her finger. And it was as if as she snapped her finger, eh, the snap, eh, it hit the ceiling, hit the other side of the ceiling. I felt like everybody in the womb heard that finger snap because it wasn't happening like that. I remember I had a driver then. He had three kids already. They were struggling to make it through. Right in front of me, he was like, oh, she's pregnant again. And I'm thinking, they weren't even trying. You know, why can't I do this? You, you feel incomplete. You feel like I'm a woman. I'm complete. I should be able to, by all means, do this. But then I had to tell myself something. Hey, I need help. But what is it in my life that I've done that I never, never needed help with? Do you understand? And I think us deciding that we needed help was, was the biggest step, the biggest step that we took. I know so many people who also are trying and trying and they're just trying and they're hoping for the best and they don't want to go out and look for help and reading is because they feel like asking for help already means you're a failure and i learned i know it's not so my christian life my spiritual world my spirit being that's everything really i don't really have anything i don't have much else that's real, that I can touch. Even though this isn't physical, it's everything. It's where everything comes from. It's where the music comes from. It's in God that I know that I'm unconditionally loved. I'm loved unconditionally. I am accepted and I am beautiful and I am powerful and I'm all those things and it never changes. There's nowhere else that it's so consistent. There's nowhere else, not within my work, not in my friendships, nowhere else is there any other kind of love that's that unconditional. The spirit world is the real world. I feel like this is all like a stage for me. You know, I, I believe that everything that I am as an artist, as a person, as a lover, as a mother, as a wife, everything that I am is guided from my posture in the spirit. If I haven't spent enough time in the presence of God as it were, I, I can't function. I can't. There's nothing. There's nothing. I want to continue creating 
You know how the first thing you read in the Bible is in the beginning God created. I want to be 90 years old. Do not be afraid. Do not be I think the the nightmare would be to stop creating. I want to be able to write music to the day that I die. I think um, music is that one thing that will never ever change. I don't think there will ever be humanity without music. You know what I'm saying? So if forever and ever I can keep creating, even if it's never for an audience, even if God is my only audience, to continue to, to, to put something where it didn't exist before. You know, I think for anyone who is a Christian, your number one quest is to be like your father. And in the holy book, he is introduced as a creator. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God said, let there be light. And he saw that the light was good and he separated light from darkness. Isn't that what we do as creative people? We make something, we define it, you know, we identify with it, we decide this is bad, we decide this is good, we, 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 we speak things into being or sing things into being or photograph an idea into being. I hope that that never stops for me. I hope that no matter what happens in my life, that my ability to do that is never taken from me. Yes, I'm good. <laughs> Jesus Christ, you are one top cookie. We are the future. We are the dream. We are the nation. We are part of this. Yes, we are so amazing. That's the least we shall be. At the heart of the nation, changing.